Okay, so I'm here with Professor Michael Middlebrooks of the University of Tampa. So Michael, again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. So just for some context, I'm not sure if I mentioned this when I first reached out, but I became aware of you and your work after seeing a TED talk you gave, I think a little over a year ago now. But recently, I think there was a re-upload, it caught my attention and I know many other people's attention. Um, and my only complaint was really that it was a bit short and I <laughs> wish that I could keep going really. So think of this talk as sort of an extension of that talk where we can hopefully cover some more ground and go into some more detail. So. Before continuing any further, I was wondering, if you don't mind, I think it'd be great if you could just introduce yourself in your own words. Who are you? What's your background? And how did you get to where you are today? Sure. Um, so my, my name is Michael Middlebrooks. I'm a, a invertebrate zoologist. Uh, I work at the University of Tampa. So um, my, my background is in studying in, invertebrate animals. And so those are uh, basically, they're mo most of the animals on the planet, basically anything that doesn't have a backbone. It's sort of an artificial category. Um, so just, you know, the sort of more familiar animals like dogs and cats and fish and stuff are all vertebrates and then everything else from sponges to, um, to corals to uh, squid and uh, gastropods, which are like sea snails and slugs, which are, which are primarily what I study to crabs and insects and all of that. Those are all invertebrates. So I study and teach about those animals is, is my primary job. Um, and the, the area that I really focus a lot of my research on is on um, uh, sea slugs. So, so um, basically, those are snails that have, over the course of evolution, lost their shell. And there's actually quite a number of different groups of them. They're not necessarily very closely related to all the different species of, of sea slugs that are out there. Um, so it's, it's, this is an event that's happened multiple times. So there's multiple groups have independently lost that shell. And I, I study various aspects of uh, biology and ecology for, for these animals. Um, there's a, a, a probably the group that people are most familiar with, if you know about sea slugs at all, would be nudibranchs. Um, and so these are a group of um, uh, often very colorful, although not always. Some of them are, are very brightly colored, very beautiful animals, and that, that's why they get a lot of attention. So they become more popular lately with uh, underwater photographers because they're kind of fun to find and capture, and because they're, some of them have really wild, um, just outlandish color patterns on them. Um, those animals are all ca carnivores, um, even though they are very slow. They, they eat even slower things. So mostly sessile animals like sponges and corals and um, uh, the animals like that. So they'll, they're able to feed on those. I, the group that I study the most, I do a little bit of nudibranch work and I've, I've been doing some more lately. The group that I study the most are called sacaglossins. So these are a, um, sort of the herbivorous counterpart to the uh, nudibranchs. Sacaglossins are another group just independently lost their shell over time. There are still a few species that have a shell uh, remnant left. Uh, not, not much of a shell, but still a little bit of one. But most of them have completely lost the shell. They feed on algae. Um, and, and the way they feed is, is different than most animals. They, they have a very tiny little microscopic tooth. They just puncture a hole inside of the algae and then they, sluck out, they, uh, they suck out the cellular content. So they feed sectorally on those. And some of these slugs can take that a step further and take the um, some of the cellular components, in particular the um, chloroplasts, which are what the plants and algae use to photosynthesize. They take those chloroplasts and they put them inside of special cells lining their digestive tract. And then the slug becomes photosynthetic. And, and that's really uh, what a lot of my research interest is, is in, is how being a photosynthetic animal, how that works, uh, what the, how that affects their ecology and sort of role in the environment and their behavior and everything related to that. So I'm going to try to bite my tongue and not race too quickly to the kleptoplastic sea slugs. But um, one question that came to my mind was in your explanation of what a sea slug is as it is, as it is differentiated from a snail and other mollusks, it's just the fact that it lost its shell, which means it should have an overlap in character with snails. So how are snails defined within the mollusk kingdom? So, so snails are, um, they're, they're a very large group of the mollusks um, and, and called, called gastropods basically is the, the larger group that includes all the snails and slugs. And um, they're sort of defined by a, a shared um, common ancestor 
through through um, through evolutionary time. Um, but there are a couple of unique gastropod characteristics that we see in in all of them. Um, so uh, the the one that is I think most universal but most difficult to explain is there's this process called torsion that they undergo during development, which is basically um, they are oriented one way as as developing eggs and larvae, and then their body does like a 180 degree twist um, so that the uh, the visceral mass, which is the part that contains all of the organs, kind of twists around 180 degrees, and um, they uh, so it kind of reorients the body, and it so it causes some some interesting anatomical problems for some of them, and they've they've solved that in interesting ways. Some of them undergo torsion during development and then undo the torsion, and so they end up back the, the normal way, but they all do that when, when they're developing. Um, they all also have a special feeding structure called a, a radula. Um, you do see that in, in most mollusks as well, though. That's not a, a strictly gastropod characteristic, but um, it is one that, that, that all the gastropods share, uh, and except for the, the bivalves like clams and scallops, and they don't have a radula anymore. They've lost it, but all the rest of the mollusks have a, a radula, which is a structure they use to feed, and in different groups of mollusks, it's modified, the shape of it changes, and you can actually tell a lot about uh, a mollusk's diet by looking at the shape of the radula. Um, you can do a sort of similar thing looking at um, the teeth in, in mammals. Um, they give you some clues for to what they're capable of eating, what their diet looks like, and so a radula is the same sort of thing. It's a lot smaller, um, so you, you know, often need a microscope to get a really good look at them, um, but that's a that's a characteristic that they'll they'll all share. Um, the name gastropod means stomach foot, and um, so they, they most of our gastropods are going to be crawling along on this very large uh, single muscular foot that that they'll be using. There's some exceptions to that. This is an enormous group of animals. And the estimates are about maybe a hundred thousand species of of. Um, mollusks overall, and most of those are, are gastropods. So there's there's a lot of diversity there, and th so there are some gastropods that have become fish shaped and started swimming, and some that are you know kind of worm shaped and burrowing or building tubes and things like that too. That so it doesn't all fit because it's such a diverse group, and nature just loves exceptions. But um, so yeah, that group gastropods is the snails and uh, and Slugs, and you know, and I, I did say that these animals lost their shell over the course of evolution, and that that is true. But a lot of them have a shell uh, as babies. So in their larval stage, there will be a very tiny shell that they then lose. So we we see that, for example, in all the nudibranchs in their larval stage, which is called a, a the swimming stage they have is called a veliger. Um, they're they're pretty cute swimming around little things, and then they undergo a metamorphosis, lose the shell. And, and become a, a, a crawling a little animal at that point. Just scratching the surface and it's already so bizarre, which again, I think is the sort of the fundamental interest for you to get into this area of study. And that's something that you mentioned in the TED talk is you get that question of why, out of anything you could do in the world, why this? And your answer, if I'm not, mistake, if I'm not mistaken, was essentially that there's so much to learn. And I think any scientist can sort of empathize with that. I mean, there's something sort of intrinsically captivating when there's an, a field of research that you don't know a lot about. But for the more pragmatically minded viewer, viewer, I should say, what are some of the more functional reasons that one might study slugs, snails, and mollusks in general? Well, so, you know, we right, we do get that question a lot for, for anything in, in sort of science related is, is about a application. And um, I... This work is not not really intended to be applied science, so it's it's sort of um, there, there's a, a number of different ways to to look at, at scientific inquiry. But um, one common sort of um, way that is broken down is between basic science, which is sort of the foundational knowledge for knowledge's sake, and then applied sciences, which are uh, in, intended to be used for some sort of human benefit. Um, and then I'm most of the work that I do is more on the on the basic uh, science side. It's we, we're learning because we're curious and want to want to know something that we that we don't know yet. Um, now, a lot of times, basic science 
leads to advances in in applied applied science and, and breakthroughs that we don't expect. So um, that that can certainly happen. A, a lot of um, really important medical breakthroughs have come from studying oceans and or, or organisms in the ocean and, and things like that. So there's been a number of pharmaceuticals developed and things like that. And there are researchers who are looking at sea slugs and some of the things they eat as potential um, potential uh, locations for novel chemical compounds that could be used in pharmaceutical applications. And, and I would not be surprised if there were some big breakthroughs from that coming uh, before too long. That's not really the kind of, kind of work that I do, though. Um, I do a little bit of applied research, um, and I do some seagrass restoration work. Um, which is sort of a, sort of a separate thing altogether. But I, I do I do some of that. I've got a new grant that I've just started on uh, earlier this year, um, where we're, we're looking at some um, components related to to seagrass uh, community changes and declines, and and hopefully eventually restoration in Tampa Bay where I live. So that is that is what the more applied sort of research that I work on is. But for the the sea slug stuff, it's mostly because I. I'm just interested in it, and I, I really like it. Um, I'm in kind of a, a what I consider to be a, a fortunate position as far as my, my research goes. I'm, I'm at a, uh, the University of Tampa, and we're we are primarily a, an undergraduate teaching institution. So my my main job is to teach invertebrate zoology courses and, and a few other things occasionally. Um, and um, research is a, also a component of my job, but it's it's a smaller component. But what that means is that I'm sort of free to do, to work on whatever I find interesting. I'm not I'm not required as part of my job to bring in these multi million dollar grants, which means I don't have to chase whatever's popular and fundable. I can I can really focus on what what I find the most interesting. It does you know often I also don't have millions of dollars to work with on a project, but there, there's a because we know so little about a lot of these animals. There, there's a lot of very straightforward uh, basic science to do. Um, it also makes it so there's a lot of opportunities for me to involve my students in, in the research and, and get them involved in it um, too. So there, there's there's some, some big advantages to that. I hope we see a world of the future where ba basic science is funded tremendously more than it is now okay. because as you said, that's that's what typically gets the Nobel Prize level sort of discoveries and that's what captivates the next generation of scientists. Um, I did want to point your attention to one example that you mentioned during your TED talk in terms of applications, which is the cone snail and the, the venom of the cone snail. And I imagine that one one of the main reasons that might be studied is just to help treat the unfortunate souls who may have be exposed to that venom. But beyond that, um, are you aware of what other biomedical applications they're hoping to derive from that venom? Yeah, so th there's some really interesting um, work going on with cone snail venom. The, so, cone snails have incredibly uh, complex molecules th that make up their venom. It, it is not a single venomous compound. It is the people who, who work on it often refer to it as a cabal. Uh, so it's multiple different different compounds working in in unison that, that makes them so venomous and deadly. And, and I should say there there's a, a lot of species of cone snails, and and they're all venomous. Um, a handful of them are extremely venomous uh, to the point where a bite w will likely kill a person. Um, most of them are, are, aren't quite quite that venomous, but they're they're all predators. They're all they're all hunting different organisms, and some of the ones that that actually hunt sleeping fish, um, they've got this incredibly potent venom. And there's been research into it for for a number of different pharmaceutical purposes. Um, one one of which is to look for anti-cancer compounds. But I think where they're having the most success is actually in making uh, new painkillers. So so new uh, a potential for a painkiller that is not an, an opioid. So one that would relieve pain from people but not cause addiction. Um, and that could be tr tremendous. So, you know, a lot of our most effective uh, painkillers right now you know, if, if somebody is in a serious accident and has to be in the hospital on morphine or something like that for a while, sometimes they have to go directly into rehab afterwards. Um, you know, and that's that's somebody who's not um, not abusing it, not doing anything. You know, that they they shouldn't be with with uh, the drugs. That's just what you know, and that's kind of 
part of what's led to the opioid crisis in, in our country and other, other countries is, is the, the highly addictive nature of those effective drugs. Um, so if, if a drug could be developed that is effective for re removing pain or, or severely reducing pain, but not causing that addiction, that would be a huge medical step forward. That would, that would be um, tremendous. And I think they're having some success in that direction with the cone snail venom. And that does sort of make sense. One of those c c compounds in there paralyzes the fish, and you know stops it from uh, from moving. And so that they're they're looking at all of those different things. They're, they're very complex venom, though. So it's some some very smart uh, biochemists working on these projects. It's so fascinating. I'm sort of a little more used to the idea. I, I've grown up here in Arizona, so I'm used to the study of rattlesnake venom and and many other venomous creatures. But it is sort of counterintuitive that one of the greatest places you can look for interesting biomedical applications is some of the places you would typically like to avoid most. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's things that animals and plants are using for their, def to defend themselves are, are a lot of times the, what, what, uh, where we're finding interesting compounds. And yeah, the, the painkiller avenue makes a lot more sense. Can't the cancer treatment that fascinates me though. That's that's a whole rabbit hole, I suppose, but I'll leave that aside for now. But I will go ahead and move on to the uh, kleptoplastic sea slugs, because again, that's sort of the meat and potatoes of, of your talk and our, of our conversation. So I just want to, you already introduced it a little bit, um, but if you don't mind, I'd like to sort of reintroduce it once more and just to clarify my own understanding um, and then see what I may have missed. Um, so first of all, these aren't sort of intrinsically photosynthetic animals. And I suppose none of the animals that photosynthesize are that way. It's a, it's a product of a symbiotic relationship with bacteria and algae and so on. But to me, one of the things that I found most fascinating is that you sort of make the distinction between the way an organism such as corals might do it and the way that the sea slugs do it. Because in the case of the corals, as I understand, they're essentially just a host of the algae. The algae photosynthesize, they produce sugars, and then the corals consume those sugars. But in the case of the sea slugs, as you said, they're actually incorporating the chloroplasts into the epithelial cells of those digestive tubules, and then are, I suppose, a bit closer to actually photosynth photosynthesizing themselves. But I, I have a laundry list of questions in terms of the details, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think you summarized that, that very well. So photosynthesis in the, in the animal kingdom is not uh, unheard of. There's, there's a number of different animals that that have managed to achieve this through symbiotic partnerships. So we, we see it in, cor I think corals are the best example. Um, they, they, that's really where uh, most corals on a, on a coral reef are getting most of their energy is through photosynthesizing, or they, rather they've got a, a photosynthetic um, unicellular algae called a dinoflagellate um, that lives in, inside of their, their tissue. Um, and that's allowing the the corals to to get a, most of their most of their energy needs and the sugar they produce and it, it is a symbi a mutualistic symbiosis in that case um we see similar sorts of things in some other organisms with some uh some single-celled green algae, with some some um some cyanobacteria uh and things like that as well so you'll see this in some sponges you'll see this in some flatworms uh acial flatworms um and a, and a handful of other different groups of organisms that, that can do that. Um, in the case of um, sea slugs, there's, there are two different types of photosynthesis that occur. So in there's some nudibranchs that feed on some photosynthetic animals like um, anemones and uh, uh, some of the, um, some of their relatives, uh, some, some th things that photosynthesize and they'll take the zooxanthellae, which are the, the, those dinoflagellates that I was talking about. That's the, term for the photosynthetic uh, dinoflagellates is zooxanthellae. Um, they'll incorporate, they'll eat them out of the, the anemone or whoever else they're feeding on and incorporate those inside of their own body uh, that way. And then so they become photosynthetic. They've got the symbionts that way. And they, it's kind of a similar thing, just the, the mechanism by which they acquire it's a little bit different. Um, for the sacaglossins, yeah, they're actually, they're not taking in a whole algal cell, they're just taking in the chloroplasts of, of the, uh, from the algae. And that's, that's quite interesting. It's very different, um, a mechanism for, for doing that. Um, 
So they don't have the whole cell, they don't have the cell, the, the nucleus and the other components of that get digested. And then the slug has to somehow, and that's one of the things we're still unraveling, it has to keep those chloroplasts alive and functioning. If we take chloroplasts out of, the, of a plant or algae cell, they won't survive very long on their own. They don't, um, they, they do have um, their own DNA, um, chloroplasts do, um, but they don't have all of the components they need to keep themselves going. And without, um, without the input from the nucleus and the other structures of the cell there, they, they, they won't survive for very long in, in most cases. So it's not, you know, just the chloroplasts by themselves aren't, aren't enough. The, the slug needs some kind of mechanism to keep them going. Um, and in some slugs, they don't, they don't have that. You'll see it that they take up the chloroplasts, they last a few days at most, and then they, they degrade, and then they, they have to feed again. But in a few, a few other species um, have gotten really good at photosynthesizing, and so they can hold on to those chloroplasts for several months and uh, continually photosynthesize. And they're, uh, they are gaining energy from that, from that photosynthesis while they're, while they're doing it. Um, the, how long they can do that varies quite a bit, it tr tremendously depending on the species, um, as I was saying. So a lot of sacagloss and sea slugs, they just eat and do, you know, do regular sort of things. They still puncture a hole in the algae and slurp out their food, but they're not, they're not photosynthesizing at all. Um, others can do it just a little bit, and then a few of them can go a really long time. I think the um, most impressive is a species called Alicia chlorotica, sometimes called the emerald sea slug. They're, they're very beautiful. Um, they live on the east coast of the United States, um, probably, I think, up into Canada even, um, and uh, uh, sort of the, the northeast coast. And they are can basically go their adult life cycle. So after they metamorphose out from being a larva, they feed on, on algae. And then once they've done that, they can survive uh, their, for the rest of their life, which is it's about nine months is how long they live. Um, and then they'll reproduce and then they all, they all die at the same time after they lay eggs. Um, but that's really impressive to, to not really need to feed again as an adult for nine months. One, one thing that one of the craziest things, as you pointed out, is that the chloroplasts themselves have their own DNA, which seems like it would be sort of a barrier to incorporation into the slug. But as I also understand, the slugs, or at least some of the slugs, are, are able to modify their own gene expression to sort of help adjust. So, well, the, I think what you're talking about is the, maybe the concept of horizontal gene transfer. Is that what you were getting at? So this is... Somewhat of a controversial idea. Uh, so horizontal gene transfer is absolutely a real thing. Um, and and there's, it's been well documented in lots of organisms. We see it most commonly in uh, bacteria. Um, so they can pick up loose fragments of DNA from the environment from other bacteria, for example, and incorporate that into their, their own genome. Um, and that, that idea is... Um, uh, pretty pretty well documented. I mean, it's uh, w one of the concerns for like the spread of antibiotic resistance is how quickly bacteria can 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 get those sort of genes from from the environment. And and there's a lot of other you know ways that they they use that. I mean, we we use that in biomedical applications. By in, you know, it's one of the ways that we've been able to manipulate bacteria for a very long time is because they're they're able to uptake. DNA from from the environment or from or from other organisms. Um, we see this also quite a bit in plants. It's been fairly well documented, and one of the um, one of the uh, ideas for how the slugs were able to maintain all of these um, chloroplasts for for so long was that they had some horizontally transferred plant or, or algae nuclear genes. So so gene, genes from the al algae's nucleus. Um, and some of the, uh, I didn't work on this project, but some of my colleagues did, and some of their, their early results were quite promising. They, they looked like this was very much what was happening. Um, a couple years ago, though, my, my, uh, the same colleagues who were working on it uh, sequenced the genome of Alicia chlorotica, that, that emerald slug, and they were not able, to, and when they did that, were not able to find any of the horizontally transferred genes. So, 
it's unclear. It, it's looking less likely that that's the explanation for it. Um, so, I mean, we, it's possible that the, the genome has, has missed that, um, but it's, it's seeming less likely. So I think we're probably going to have another explanation for how the slugs are able to do that. I don't know what that is yet either. And that's sort of part of the, the excitement. Um, that, it was a very interesting hypothesis, and we, we do, you know, you, you do see it a, a lot in, in a number of different living organisms, um, genes transferred from, from one organism to, to another. Um, but that so far does not appear to be the case, or if it is, it's not, it's not a full explanation for what's happening. So what do we know for the time being? I know it's a big outstanding question, but have we taken at least some baby steps into elucidating what's going on or for the time being, are we, are we blind? So I wouldn't say we're blind. We're, we're starting to, to learn some about, uh, some of what's happening from, from, a you know, from, a, a molecular and biochemical uh, level. So there, there's um, a variety of different research inquiries going into to different species of slugs and, and learning sort of about what what uh, additional sort of support proteins are being produced under different conditions and, and what, um, you know, how that's affecting animal metabolism and, and things like that. I'd say we're still very early in this though before you know there's not a big headline sort of thing yet f for this um, we, we know they're doing it and we know it's interesting but and we're it's slowly being chipped away at i think we're going to get um a lot of what we we learn is probably going to come from from more genomic sequencing so as um this is this is something where we're going to be learning a lot about a, a lot of different organisms. But as we can sequence a whole genome, all of the DNA in an organism, um, we can learn a lot. Uh, right now, the sort of barriers to that are costs and computing power. But those are both things that are that are becoming more accessible. So I think that that we're going to be able to see more high quality genomes, and we, and we already are soon, and and more analyses that get us. An idea for, for how these sort of things work. Um, we're not we're not all the way there yet, and even you know even once we have full genomes for a lot of these animals, there'll still be a lot of work to do. Um, you know you can't uh, you you can't reduce everything to to um, you know computer data and, and get all the answers. You have to you have to go back into the lab and into the field and test and and see more. But it it's going to give us a lot of a lot of very useful clues. So I think. I think that's where a lot of this is headed right right now. I imagine another barrier might just be sort of manpower. Like, how big is the research community in this space? Is this are we talking hundreds of researchers globally or thousands? I would not say thousands. Definitely not. Probably um, low hundreds. I would assume. Yeah, I think that's pro probably accurate. I mean, it sort of depends on how you define the community. Um, one thing I, I will say, you know, for for studying sea slugs, is that a, a lot of the uh, natural history information that we're learning is coming from citizen scientists. So observations made by people who are scuba diving and, photo uh, and photographing slugs. So it's, it tells us a lot about, you know, where these animals actually are and what, you know, observations of what what sort of behaviors they're doing and things like that. That's that that is a lot of the the barrier to this is just time in the in the water with the animals is difficult. A lot of them are kind of rare. So, you know, sometimes those observations can be, be really valuable. I'm, I'm working on a project right now, um, which, is, which is a fairly simple one. We've been working on it for a couple of years where we're, we're just documenting the different species of sea slugs that live in Tampa Bay. So there's not really a comprehensive record on that. So it's a project I started a couple of years back and we've been chipping away at it. Um, but uh, a number of those species that I've been able to add to our inventory came from observations from, from um, professional underwater photographers and citizen scientists doing doing that. So that's that is helping a, a lot with the sort sort of the um, having enough person power to get, to get all that done is you know the the increased public interest in in these animals. It's helping helping a lot. So the the diving community is making a big difference here. I think citizen science is truly one of the most incredible things that modern technology and modern communications has allowed. And it's such an underutilized tool. So in, in the case of documenting sea slugs, is there a sort of a 
paved path for people to get involved in this way or is it sort of up to them if they may have spotted something to find reach out to you or another researcher with the appropriate background i i think it's quite quite variable uh, all, all over the place for for those sorts of things so in, in in my case it was from from people that i'm personally friends with uh primarily who who do this and they um reached out to me about some things. I asked them about some things that, you know, that they else they might've seen. And, and they got me in contact with some additional people and it just kind of, you know, organically grew from there. Um, there have been more organized uh, sorts of things in, in some other parts of the world uh, as well. There's, I think a group in Australia that's doing a, a, at least annual citizen science neuterbrank surveys. Um, and they've been having a lot of success with that. Um, and I do more and more see people, you know, pulling uh, in, in scientific publications, pulling data from sorts of things where people are, are posting stuff online, particularly with like iNaturalist and, um, and things like that. So that, that can, I'd say like iNaturalist is sort of the most pre-paved sort of way that people can get involved in, in observations is, um, you know, p uploading photos to that um, can, can be useful if you see something interesting in nature. You can put it up there and it it is also fun for people to 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 do that and there's you know other people involved in it, it can help you figure if you don't know what you found and you get a good photo of it the, the community on there will often help people identify what they're looking at yeah it's super cool and and then in, in the case of the biodiversity in tampa bay specifically of mollusks and sea slugs how does that compare to you know, when I reached out to you, you mentioned you were in the Philippines and from the photos you showed, I mean, it seems like you've been all over the world. What's the ground zero of sea slug biodiversity? Where's the best place to go if you want to look? Ground zero uh, for, for biodiversity of sea slugs, which is uh, pretty much ground zero for biodiversity of everything in the ocean, is the Coral Triangle. So it's um, the area that includes the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and then Papua New Guinea, and out to the Solomon Islands. Uh, so those those countries and the water surrounding them just have incredible diversity of of everything. And I, I I'll give you an example uh, of that. When I was in um, work, I've been working on this project in Tampa. We found a, a lot of different species of sea slugs over about four years. I found more species in four days of diving in the Philippines. So it's just like the. And how many, how many are we talking? How many in Tampa and how many did you find? in? So I days? think on my last count, we were, I think we're at 77 species we've documented in, in Tampa Bay. Are these new species entirely or new for the geography? So these are just things that we've been able to document that, that live here. So most, many of these are not new to the area. We're just trying to put this all together into one sort of package, uh, well, it'll be a publication that, that just records everything that's in the area. There, there's scattered um, uh, scientific literature on it, but, but nothing really comprehensive. And a lot of stuff is pro, you know, not specifically listed for, for the area. Some of these uh, are, that we found are likely new species uh, or, or not non undescribed species. Um, I, Currently, we're not we're not describing them beyond just including that these are these are here and this is what they you know a, a morphological description. We're not we're not formally naming these at this point. We don't I don't have enough specimens. Those were all um, things were rare that we found one or two of, but don't don't seem to match any descriptions for for anything um, that we've been able to find. So there's there's definitely lots of undescribed sea slug species out there just from. A lot of them are tiny, uh, a lot of them are rare, and, uh, you know, there hasn't been as much work done in, in a lot of, lot of this. So, um, yeah, uh, so I think about 77 is where we're at right now. Um, and two, two of those are non-native as well. There were two, two that are native to other parts of the world um, that we found. But that's also not uncommon. Is there any threat of some of those becoming uh, invasive species or not so much? It's possible, um, but it's uh, so you know the 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 definition the the difference between an invasive and a non-native species is that an invasive one is is something that's causing some kind of harm to the ecosystem, um, and so far there doesn't that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, you know I'm not finding a lot of them, 
but if that changes and they start, you know, they start having a big impact, that that certainly could. When we've got more than our share of invasive species in, in Florida um, that are causing a variety of, of uh, different problems. Um, uh, but so far, I don't think any of those are sea slugs. Um, there, there, I do know of a couple of non-natives um, that are not uncommon to see in like the Florida Keys, but I, again, I don't think we don't actually probably know enough to, 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 to decide if they're causing a problem or not. Yeah. I mean, time will tell, but that sounds, it, that sounds like an optimistic take that we don't have anything to worry about in the present is always good. And then in terms of the highest biodiversity being in the coral triangle, does that equate to Bilso being your favorite place to dive? Or is there something about some of, another location, the Red Sea off the coast of Cuba, et cetera, that even if it has slightly lower biodiversity, is more interesting to you? Oh, I think it's all really interesting. Um, so I, I do really like uh, scuba diving in the um, countries in, in the Coral Triangle for, for a lot of reasons. Um, the biodiversity out there is spectacular. There's a lot of really neat things to see. Um, but I, yeah, I, scuba diving is one of, one of my passions. It's one of my favorite hobby. And so, so I, you know, I do diving for work, but I also dive quite a bit for my own enjoyment. Um, and I, I like to see as many different places as I can. And so while, yes, there's more biodiversity in, in areas in the Coral Triangle, there's still a lot to see all over the place. All, all, a lot of the world's oceans are really very interesting. And so any opportunity to go see something different to me that, you know, is, is always exciting. Um, I went uh, this past summer, I went for the first time to the um, Sea of uh, Cortez in, in Mexico. Uh, and, you know, that was, uh, has certainly lower biodiversity than anything in the Coral Triangle, but I had never seen any of those animals before. So I, I was just thrilled. There were so many different neat, uh, I found a lot of snails and slugs while I was there, but there's a lot of other big, big, interesting animals out there too. Um, and I, I, I absolutely loved it and just you know, something different. Um, in Florida, we do, we do have um, also a lot of lot of good diving here, um, particularly on the East Coast. There's a lot of people who are really interested in, in starting to find nudibranchs. And uh, there's a couple of areas, particularly the place called the Blue Heron Bridge, uh, where divers are regularly going out and looking for nudibranchs or other small um, mac macro invertebrates and um, you know photographing them looking at them enjoying them so there 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 is a lot to see in, in other places you don't have to go across the world to do it but it is if you have the opportunity it's fun and, and neat to see all the all the different sorts of things yeah and that, that feeds very nicely into my next question which is you know even though your specialty is slugs at the end of the day you are an invertebrate zoologist so beyond slugs snails and, and even outside of mollusks if you like what are some of the other invertebrate animals that are particularly captivating to you? Um, yeah, well, that's a good question. So I, 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 I really enjoy um, a, a variety of different things. So, so one, anything I've never seen before, if I find that underwater, I'm, I'm very excited about that. Um, but anything doing something that is funny, I also enjoy. So there, there's a lot of very silly crustaceans. Uh, underwater, they, they look silly to me. So, like, there's some there's some crabs that are that I just find hilarious. The, um, a couple of them, uh, there's some the common name for them is shame faced crabs, and they, they have these big these claws that go over their face like this. And they if they if they see you, they'll do this ridiculous shoveling motion and bury themselves under the, the sand like that. Um, I really like. Anytime you run into a cephalopod, which is like a squid or octopus, cuttlefish, anything like that, that is always an, an entertaining time underwater. I mean, even if they don't, a lot of them are shy and will just leave and not, not really interact with you. But sometimes they're curious. Sometimes they don't, they don't care that you're around. And so I've, I've had some very interesting scuba dives watching octopus hunt, for example, is, is very, uh, it's, it's really neat. Um, in the Philippines recently, when I, w I was there, we did on some of the night dives, see some bobtail squid, which are, they're about the size of a grape. Um, and they're just, they're absolutely adorable little, little squid that hang out on, around the bottom looking for stuff to eat. And they, they also bury themselves when they, um, if you see them, but they stick their, their eyes are sticking up and they'll take their little arms out and start piling sand on their head. And it's, it's, it's adorable. Um, 
So it's uh, that's a lot of fun. Um, there are, yeah, I, there's so much interesting stuff to, to see in uh, in the ocean. Um, I was uh, I'm trying to think. So we we did um, a, a dive in. We did a blackwater dive uh, in the Philippines, and so that that is a very different kind of diving. It's it's sort of recently taken off in popularity, but you go out into deep water. Um, so this, you know, be at least several hundred feet deep, if not several thousand, and you don't go down that deep. You're in, you know, stay within normal recreational dive limits. So I don't think we went any deeper than 60 or 70 feet, but you have these big lights hanging down in the water with you and it attracts all these little critters and that starts bringing in all these big critters. And so you get to see all these really strange, diverse, uh, pelagic animals, um, that, that kind of come up from the deep. And so you see a lot of very weird things that you, you normally would not get an opportunity to see. So it's a lot of translucent animals, a lot of comb jellies, a lot of jellyfish, uh, and salps, which are little free swimming tunicates that often are sort of chained together. Um, and then there's other animals riding on top of those. So you'll see like a jellyfish that's got a little uh, larval crab sitting on top of it or a shrimp, or some of the salps were covered in little tiny octopus were hanging out all over them. Um, so there's just, it, it's, there's so much weird stuff to see uh, out there. Um, and so, I, yeah, I get excited about a lot of them. The ocean, and again, being from Arizona, I not not my most familiar territory, but it's so sometimes, you know, even having watched endless nature documentaries and, and looked endlessly into various different marine topics, it always comes back to, it just strikes me as so alien. Alien to the point where, Whatever we may find in the future, if we find anything off of Earth, I'm not convinced it will be much different than what we find in the ocean in terms of just how <laughs> different it is than us. Yeah, there's there's so much to, to see, and it's just, it's such a different environment, right? Um, when when animals moved onto the land, you, you've got all these other constraints that go with it, and and insects and birds can fly, but you know, from from our perspective you know, stuff on the land is moving and it's more or less in two dimensions, right? Like you, you, you've got access to the third dimension, but not, not really, you know, it's, it's pretty limited and underwater though, that, that all changes. And so you can get these really strange life forms, these very different body forms that, that won't, don't work in a sort of terrestrial environment. And, um, and when you also consider that, um, most of the, the uh, phyla of, of animals that exist originated in the ocean. Right? That's, where they, that's where they evolved. They've had m more opportunity to, to diversify and, and split off into to more interesting groups. So there's, there's just so much opportunity for, for strangers. And it is, it is foreign to us a, a little bit too, right? We're, we're terrestrial animals. So the whole thing, the fluid medium, the... Um, the, the, all the different shapes and things that are down there is, is yeah, the, the wonders don't stop. It's just, it's, it's never ending. It, it really is bizarre. And speaking of bizarre, I wanted to talk to you about cephalopods in particular and, and specifically octopi because they're mollusks. Yet I think I would, I, 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 one could argue that they are sort of in their own subcat. I mean, they are in their own subcategory, but they're just so bizarre, truly, truly bizarre, and not what you think of when you hear mollusk. So what actually categorizes them in that kingdom in the first place? And what what's going on with them, I suppose? Yeah, so the um, all of everybody in Phylum Mollusca, they, they do have some shared characteristics, kind of like what we were talking about for for, for the gastropods, right? now. Um, but these are this is a little bit broader level because that includes the gastropods. So all of the mollusks share a, a handful of characteristics. Um, one, one, they do all have a shared common ancestor. So that's sort of ultimately what, what puts every, what puts a, an organism into a particular group is, is that they all share that, that last common ancestor. But there's characteristics that kind of go along with defining mollusks as well. That radula was one that I talked about before. That's one of them. And cephalopods do have a radula. It is modified. It's a little bit different than what, what you're going to see in, in snails, but it, it, it's a similar sort of um, function. It's, it's for feeding. So uh, a lot of them use it for breaking through shells or drilling holes in shells of, of, of clams or things that they're, they're going to be eating. Um, all of the, the cephalopods do also have a foot. 
but it's been highly modified. So instead of um, instead of being a single solid foot, it's been modified into all of those arms and or tentacles that you see um, on those those animals. Um, they have also uh, lost the shell, um, like we like we see in our um, uh, our slugs. Um, but it, it's sort of a a matter of degree. So that we do have a couple species of cephalopods that still have shells. It's the, the Nautilus. Um, they, they do still have an external shell. And there's a number of others that have remnants of internal shells um, as well. So they're inside the body. And then you get all the way down to uh, an octopus, which is completely lost and any remnant of a shell whatsoever. So uh, the, the, there's those, those um, you know, those, those are uh, some of the main characteristics that you'll see with with them is the, those modifications to the to the body form, um, and then along with that came some additional things that, that sort of came later. And you don't necessarily see this in some of the more primitive animals, like um, like the nautilus that still has the shell. Like uh, they, while they do have an eye, it's not that super well developed eye that we'll see in an octopus. And they do have a brain, but it's not the uh, you know intelligent brain that we're going to see in an animal like like an octopus either. Um, and they're not able to uh, change colors like you can like you can find an, an octopus able to do. It's um, so those are characteristics that kind of developed later. Um, and we we see a, a fair bit of diversity within the cephalopods. They're, they're the one of the smaller groups of mollusks. There aren't aren't as many species for them. I always uh, give them a, a full day of lecture in my invertebrate zoology class because they're just so interesting and different from everything else that they needed and students always want more but we have a lot a lot of other things to cover so I can't I can't do do more than that but usually but and they're, they're, yeah they're they're endlessly fascinating it is it is always a day where I'm struggling to finish everything because there's so much to talk about and they're so they're so interesting and the be, the behaviors that they they exhibit are so complex and so fascinating and I, I suppose that their behaviors are, I mean, they're a consequence of their intelligence. But one thing that I, I've never really understood is why they are so uniquely intelligent compared to, you know, most every other animal on the earth with a few exceptions, because they don't, it seems, they've also evolved to have the color changing and so many other different evolutionary assets that it seems like they might not need to be that intelligent. Yeah, the the evolution of intelligence is is interesting, and that's this is certainly not not my area of expertise at all. Um, that you know, there's not not anyone making arguments that uh, that sea slugs are exhibit this incredible intelligence. They they have they do have brains and behaviors and things like that, but uh, they're not, you know, they are not um, uh, out there doing, uh, you know, they're not solving many puzzles. Um, no Einstein slug yet. Yeah, right. Yeah, not yet. Who knows? Um, but what? Uh, a couple of interesting things, and, and may, maybe this gets at the answer. Maybe it doesn't. Um, so, uh, what? One interesting thing uh, for maybe how some of this intelligence started to evolve um, comes from not the advantages of intelligence itself, but sort of uh, related things. So, um, for us. We have fairly fast nerve conduction. So, um, and, and in vertebrates, we, we can we can do this because our, our nerves are myelinated. So it's basically sort of an insulation along the nerve that allows for jumps of the nervous signal between synapses, and that, that speeds up how quickly the, this nervous signal can be transmitted. In invertebrate animals, you usually don't see that. There are a few exceptions, but that it's much less common. And um, Instead, what you get is the axons, which is where, where the myelination would occur on, on, on the neurons. They are larger. And so in squid, for example, um, they have giant uh, axons, um, la large enough that they can actually, in, in a dissected squid, uh, you, you can see them sometimes with, with the naked eye. Um, so it's better with magnification, of course. But um, And that, that's one of the ways that we've learned about how nervous systems work is by studying these mollusk systems. So um, having that really lar uh, large um, axon allows for fast nerve transmission, right? And that's useful for escaping from, from predators, for example. So if that comes first, right, 
and then additional components are added on to that and, and you know eventually you end up with an intelligent animal. That may not be exactly how it happened, but that's one po possibility. Um, it's hard, hard to reconstruct um, you know, how a characteristic like intelligence that doesn't leave a fossil record evolved. You know, because it's not uh, it's not as um, as obvious as, as sort of physical characteristics might might be, but um, that that's something to do with it. And, and there are a lot of advantages for intelligence in terms of you know hunting for food, for avoiding predators, th things like that. So I think once it's once it's there and sets in, it can it can be very very useful. Um, but yeah, it's it, they are they are absolutely fascinating with that and. I, I also think it's very interesting that they're so intelligent, but they're not, um, you know, they're not past teaching that to the next generation, the way that they, their life cycle goes. There's not, there's not a, you know, transmitted knowledge from one generation to the next, like, like, you know, mammals can teach their young how to do things. That's, it doesn't happen with them. They have to come out basically ready to do, do everything right away. So they just, they, when they hatch, it's a little tiny octopus. It makes it that just makes it even more bizarre. And I, again, like who knows what the details are, but it seems likely that it's it's an emergent property of the physiology, one way or the other. But yeah, but it's it it, it is it is really fascinating, and it, it's uh, it's also I mean as we're learning more about how their intelligence is different from the other animals that that have evolved that way. I mean the the way their nervous system is is structured is is quite different from 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 ours it is not well they do have a central nervous system they have a brain a lot of their um uh decisions are 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 made you know in the individual arms of an octopus so um the the, the neurons there are, are making a lot of choices for how a, a goal is accomplished and it's it's very interesting they're they're incredible it's that simple they really are incredible and it's crazy that we just still have Sometimes it surprises me that, you know, we've been studying these animals for so long, yet there's still so much to know. It just speaks to the complexity of the organism. So I will leave you with one final question, which is a simple one, but perhaps a difficult one. We'll see, which is what do you think, what, what do you wish that everyone knew about slugs? There's one thing, one set of things that you wish everyone knew. Well, um, that's a, I don't know if I thought about that before. Let's see. Uh, I guess I would I would like it if people knew how diverse and colorful and interesting they can be. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of times that when I tell somebody I work on slugs and their their first thought is something gross and slimy, and they they are admittedly slimy, uh, but something gross and that you know that they at best is eating their garden. Uh, so may, maybe just some idea about the diversity out there and, and some of the beauty associated with it. I think that would be a good, a great start for us, um, for, for everyone to know about. Well, I hope that everyone who listened this far is enjoying this and reveling in the beauty of slugs and snails and all of the other mollusks. And again, hopefully that anyone who saw your TED talk already and felt like me who wanted to know more has enjoyed this conversation. And again, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me.